On this episode, we talk how PR and building brand can get you not only recruited, but get you to other sponsors. Welcome to another episode of Inside the League. Today I have with me Amy, founder of Grit PR. Thank you, Amy, so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me. So tell me a little bit about how you came to start Grit. Yeah, so I started Grit when I saw a huge gap in the name, image, and likeness market for college athletics. I actually took a trip out to Texas, and obviously they have big programs out there, and name, image, and likeness is huge out there, and so are collectives. And at the time, I was working in the front office for Angel City Football Club, and I thought I was going to stay front office took that trip to Texas and then it just kind of hit me that there's a huge need here. Athletes are getting people to connect to brands and athletes have plenty of that kind of support, but they don't have the public relations, the long-term public perception branding support that they really need to take it from like a one hit wonder of an NIL deal into a long-term brand. So with that in mind, um, I launched Grit PR in June of 2022 with half the business focused exclusively on college athletes. The other half is more traditional PR retainers, but the driving force behind why I started Grit was really seeing that need for college athletes to have support. So I'm actually going to jump right into the PR portion because a couple of things you said yeah. sparked kind of the wheels turning for me. Um, what do you think is the difference between the traditional PR retainer function versus what you do in terms of NIL and college athletes? Yeah, it's fairly similar in terms of doing the same kind of building blocks in terms of you'll pitch the client, you'll have the media lists, you'll um, have media kits for them. It's fairly similar in terms of that, but I think it's a lot more performance-based and it's a lot more nimble in the sense that all athletes have incredibly busy, crazy, hectic schedules. And some have coaches that don't put out their schedules until, you know, the night before, two nights before the day. So I think being a lot more nimble with the college athletics, um, for sure, but the bread and butter PR is still fairly similar. It's just more dependent on performance and in season. Like, I will see more interest from journalists when a gymnast is in season than three months before the season. And then if they're doing well, I'll see more interest when they're performing well. Um, and that's just kind of on me to notice those trends and to take, um, to really take advantage of those peaks and performance. So one thing that you said that I think is interesting and does is not often correlated in athlete world is like the ebb and flow of awareness mm -hmm. right so yes. even though you may have a pr relationship or even some potential brands kind of bubbling and talking if you're in season it's probably an influx that you have to turn down something versus if you're out of season it's a little slower so it is kind of a cycle of yeah. awareness that can happen yeah. okay it's much more and cyclical so i would say Given that PR has traditionally been television and magazines, um, how do you think PR is changing for the athlete when they're really engulfed in more of a social driven world? I think that with particular athletes, it might make certain platforms that have more of a social media following, it might make them more advantageous um, for them and might draw them a little bit more. So I still pick the more traditional TV, radio. Um, I would say podcast isn't really emerging, right? But as the last like five years, it would be emerging, right? So, um, but for example, I got an inbound request for one of my athletes and the, when I was doing research to vet the opportunity to make sure it was a fit for him, the social media platform was huge. And he has a really nice social media following as well. And I told him that I said, hey, here's an opportunity that I have for you. Um, I think that it, one, it's a fit for you, but two, their social media is also very strong, which means that you can kind of play off of their social media when you're being interviewed and it'll be a good way to just raise your brand awareness. 
Got it. You're looking more at like the 360 view, like, hey, I'm going to pitch this, um, you know, magazine front cover. But then also if that publication has a pretty decent following on social, I'm going to also try to integrate or do a collaborative post or something there as well. Yeah, absolutely. Just because why, why not? Why not use more of the platform? Um, like why not use as much as possible and I would say like my athlete Raekwon Smith from Norfolk State the king of NIL with over 70 uh seven deals right now he he's very good at that he does that pretty naturally but he's, he's a perfect example of taking advantage of the opportunities that he has like every time that he gets interviewed he'll make sure like if he puts it to his YouTube channel for example he'll make sure he credits every person that he worked with um by name and he does you know he really tries to integrate as many people as possible and so that's kind of a way to just guarantee that the coverage that you obtain doesn't just stay at the coverage that you obtained right it kind of expands beyond itself whether it's social whether it's youtube whether it's engaging with the journalist whatever that might be so that's a really good hack i think that you pointed out is whenever you're doing any type of anything uh, press non-press any type of appearance anything making sure that you not only repost it for whoever is like the big player that you're dealing with, but also anybody that was involved, if it's the front office person that answered the phone, just so that it has more of a long tail on it and it continues to yeah. get eyes on it. That's a really good tip. So in terms of PR, what gets an athlete noticed? What kind of qualities do they have to have or brand do they have to have? Is there a certain requirement? I think it depends. Um, that's kind of my job to find the niche point that every athlete will center around. So whenever I onboard a college athlete, I always discern with them what their lasting point is, what their message is. Um, so for example, I work with Bailey Moody out of the University of Alabama, and she's a bronze medalist with Team USA for Paralympic um, women's wheelchair basketball. And and her main point is like wanting to be kind of the premier in that sport, one of the best in the country and known for her impact. And so then everything that I do to pitch her then centers around that. So I think that's really important is by the athletes being confident in like a central point and whatever so that what, central point is, it points back to it. What's kind of maybe two or three questions an athlete can ask themselves so that they can help figure out, all right, this is where I want to focus. This is what I want to be known for. Yeah. I think one great question is when I introduce myself to people, what do I always say? Okay. That's a good one. I think that's a really good way to kind of discern if there's repeat things and then kind of what are your aspirations and what makes you stand out from the rest of um, the rest of the crowd? rest of the team, the rest of the program. Um, there's a great book called Athletes Are Brands Too by Jeremy Darlow. And okay. it's super bite-sized and incredible. And he talks about like a positioning statement, like how does Russell Wilson, at the time that he wrote the, the book, it was, he was at the Seahawks. How does Russell Wilson stand out from the rest of the Seahawks? How does the punter Marquette King stand out? Well, he stands out because he has personality, right? Mm -hmm. So like having a statement why you would stand out for other people and i think that like if athletes as as young as possible figure out what what makes them unique and just really lean into it because everyone has something mm -hmm. it's just a matter of finding it and then deciding that you're comfortable with it and then really leaning into it making sure that everything circles around got it so i know you worked um, in the front office for a couple of different teams semi pro and league teams what do you think is an athlete noticed from teams in terms of either at the college going to semi-pro, semi-pro going to pro? What do you think helps an athlete stand out and get that awareness so that the teams even know who they are? Yeah, I would say if they get an opportunity, just the professionalism is great. And like the, the where we're all to interact well with all members of staff so if you know if you get a tryout a walk-on invitation or whatever it might be you know be prompt be prepared handle your business and be kind and aware of all the members of the staff around you 
because it's not just your coaches that work, right? Like I was talking to one of my former interns and she's a student video assistant at Michigan, but like she's involved in the team. There are people everywhere. So I'd say like, if you get that opportunity to, to handle it with professionalism and just treat everyone really well around you. Um, and I would say for the younger athletes, just focus on performance and lean into any resources that a coach might have for recruiting, like a high school coach. And if your high school coach doesn't have um, doesn't have resources or isn't really into recruiting, find a mentor that does. Um, that's how I went about my um, my recruitment phase. I was recruited to play D2 women's water polo. And I did not have a coach that supported the recruitment process. So in high school, I found a coach that had played at, she played at Stanford and she coached in the area. And I had her help me figure out how to reach out to coaches for, for college and trying to get on a college team. So she helped me guide that recruitment process because traditionally for high school, the coaches should be sending tape. And we had a coach that was just not sending tape, not doing any of that. So if you get stuck in a situation like that, like there's find a coach nearby, find someone and just say, Hey, can I like steal an hour or two of your time to walk through how I should reach out to college coaches? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. First of all, that's the first time I've heard that you were able to source someone who was uh, participated in the recruitment process. Cause most athletes think that, you know, things start and end with the coach. So can you just talk a little bit about how you even figured out that the other coach participated in the recruitment? Was it just Google or did you, like, how did you figure out that there was someone in proximity or close to the recruitment process yeah. that you could lean on? So in this case, I leaned on the club programs, which I think most athletes can do because most 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 sports have club programs around yeah. in the area. So when my high school coach wasn't doing it and my club team wasn't doing it, um, I reached out actually to a swim coach who I knew had a background in water polo. So that's okay. kind of how I found her. But I think like going the club route and finding different coaches in the local area, that that's a successful way that worked for me because they usually okay. will have the background. And I feel like, it, like in her case, she was happy to lend like a couple hours to talk through it with me because it, you know, it's not too much. She's not the one sending all the letters. She's not the one doing all the work. She just was there for the guidance portion, which was so huge. And so did you end up sending like your own letters and your own film or did you still have to go yeah. to like a third to get that? Oh, really? I sent wow. my own. I sent everything on my own. Yeah. Hats off to you. So I was in the work. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, it, it can, you can do it. Like, that's the thing is it's, you know, if I, I think that's what I didn't realize and I maybe wish I would have realized a little bit earlier, but like, if, like, if your coach isn't handling that, you can take the recruitment process into your own hands. You don't have to be dependent on a coach so that like, I knew like what I should be putting in the letters and stuff, but then like take it into your own hands. Right. You know, you're a big tournaments and reach out to coaches like, Hey, I'm at this big tournament. Like, I know you're going to be there. Like, I play my first visit this time, right? Like, you know, even that simple. And yeah. all those emails, all those emails and all those mailing addresses are all on the college athletic websites. They're very, especially the public schools, they're very like forward with their information. So you can get phone numbers, emails, mailing addresses, all of that. Great tip. Great. Like, um, I think, especially for uh, athletes who may go to schools who are not as popular in high school or yeah. who don't get the notoriety all the time, that that's gold right there. Like you gave them, here is the unlock to do it yourself. Here's where you look for it on the college yeah. website. Here's what you do. You send the email where you're going to be playing. You yeah. get them to show up. Um, I think you just saved like 10 athletes right there if they actually follow through <laughs> with it. So thank you for that tip. That's amazing. Um, I do know a lot of athletes think just like at their level, everything starts and ends with the coach and all decisions start and end with the coach. Yeah. Uh, but from your experience in the front office, what does the front office actually do? What decisions do they make? I mean, it, it's usually separated in terms of there's usually a GM who has a lot of the decision making process. Um, so that's, I think, something that people don't understand necessarily unless really ingrained in sports they don't understand that the coach in a healthy team environment um in my opinion a coach will not have the ultimate say so like you look and there's exceptions like bill belichick at the patriots he operates as gm but that is very rare and few and far between 
Um, so for the most part, there's a GM that's operating um, and they operate in the front office in conjunction with the coaching staff. And the front office is making all sorts of decisions in terms of what Angel City, it was sponsorship decisions. It was how do we, you know, how do we explore the NFT space? It was how do we approach the draft? Like all of these different things that really guide the culture of the team and really the fan facing things. So while the, the soccer ops side was focused very specifically on like recruitment and on training and on scouting um, leading into the draft. It, the other side was like, how do we engage people? How do we engage fans? How do we bring sponsors on board? And how do we navigate all of these things that just grow, grow the team and grow the brand uh, more specifically? So they're going through that right now, like Angel City, they're about to be at the draft for the NWSL. So they're going through that right now, that new phase of like where soccer ops really merges with the front office because that's all hands on deck, like communications comes in board, like sponsorship comes on. It's, it's everyone operating together. Got it. So kind of like half is recruiting the new pipeline of players to come in and half mm -hmm. is awareness and fandom and driving revenue mm -hmm. to the particular team. Do you think, because half is focused on uh, awareness, do you think an athlete already having a brand and a following uh, creates like an added incentive or a bump in their recruitment anyway? Yes. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we signed Kristen Press at the time is because, you know, she was very, she's, she's a premier athlete right? She's at the top of her game, but she's also a local. And that's what people don't also realize that they can kind of pull a card. Like in her case, right? She's a premier athlete working for a pro or playing for a pro team. So she doesn't need that leverage really as much. But for a younger athlete, like a high school athlete, like being a local can matter because being local makes it so much easier to get media coverage. Um, and people really like homegrown athletes. So right. Angel City made a concerted effort in their recruiting, and that was a decision that was made on the soccer operations side. They made a concerted effort to draft, make, or sign local Los Angeles players to make sure that there were athletes who represented the community. And so there That's are different teams, like in college teams, that are still looking for that. Like, who doesn't want a homegrown star? It's fine, right. <laughs> it's a good storyline. Yeah. So building brand kind of works in a couple of different avenues. A, it works if you want to have collaborations with brands. It works and helps mm -hmm. your recruiting efforts to get on teams. It works and um, helps out kind of in your own personal long term, whatever your passion projects are. Um, building yeah. brand kind of feeds all those avenues if you start and do it well. Um, so, Amy, first of all, you have had so many tips and hacks that you have shared in this little bit of time. So thank you for that. Please, please tell yeah. everyone where they can find you and what grid is up to. Yeah. So right now we just signed another college athlete, um, Elijah Brown, um, out of Delaware state. He's our second HBCU athlete. So that's very exciting. Um, you can follow grit public relations on LinkedIn and on Instagram, um, at grit public relations. And then my personal handle on Twitter and Instagram is at Ames Chess. And just kind of always keeping people in the loop. One, thought leadership. I post weekly thought leadership about anything in the NIL or the sports landscape. And then also that's kind of where you'll get all your updates for new athletes or new clients that come on board. So it's definitely the line for all things grit PR. Well, again, thank you so much for being on today. Really appreciate it and appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It was fun. I enjoyed it.